Kingston Town can't win. Burton Crusher and our Waverley Star, stride for stride. Cometh the hour, cometh the legend, Weeks has done it. So we're joined by the head trainer of the powerhouse, that is TRK Racing, Mark Walker. Mark, thanks for having us. Uh, pleasure. Firstly, did you just have a, a bit of a brief history of TRK? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but 12 times champion stable, uh, eight in New Zealand and four in Singapore. And you also have the TRK stud now? Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. So, yeah, it's been going. Well, Dave uh, created it back, uh, not sure of the year, but um, it's been going a fair while and it's just built momentum, especially the last probably 10 years. So hopefully it keeps building momentum. Uh, could you just tell us more about um, this complex and the, the different complexes Tiako has um, around and, yeah, just what a normal day uh, would look like for you um, around here? Yeah, so alarm goes off at 10 past three in the morning, so bounce out of bed, uh, come down to the office we're in now and then all the foremans report in with horses that might have left feed or temperatures or any, anything like that. And uh, Myself and Sam Burgesson, our assistant trainer, we just run through any changes we might have to make in the work list then, and then one of us will go to each different barn. We've got, um, so we've got a colt barn here of 30, and then we've got a middle barn and... And uni barn, 20 each side, so there's 40 there, and just a smaller barn of 12. So it sort of um, caters to all different types of horses. And then just up the road, we've still got a, our original barn, which has is on 20 acres, so that has paddocks as well. So now we think we can cater for most different types of horses, yeah. And you've got the racetrack here, which is obviously handy. Um, I'd imagine you use that quite a, quite a bit from, um, from all the training. Yep, yep. So we just walk across the, uh, to the training track here. So the barn up the road, the horses float up the road to um, come to the track work. But no, Matter Matter training track's been a, a wonderful facility over the years, even going back to, you know, horses like, um, you know, David and Paul O'Sullivan were, uh, you know, the, the big hitters here. And Tiakiao's sort of taken over from that. But it's sort of stood the test of time. You go back to horses like Waverley Star, Surface Paradise, all those sort of horses. And then, obviously, recently, you know, you had Princess Cope, Darcy Brahma, um, Melody Bell, Tiaka Shark, those sort of horses. So there's been a lot of great horses trained out of uh, out of Matter Matter. Even Ocean Park, he, he was another gun horse. So, no, it's been a brilliant facility over a long number of years. And just a bit more of a... Uh, a brief overview of your career uh, individually. How did it all begin? Uh, why did you get into horse training? You've obviously trained across both jurisdictions now. Yeah, it was sort of by accident. I was uh, I was going to school in Hamilton and I was riding track work for Graham Rogerson and uh, we'd moved up. We were dairy farmers from a place called Taranaki and when we moved up north, um, so I was in the seventh form, so I was about 16, maybe 17 years old and there's a pretty girl down the corner of the road and I, whatever I did, I just was going nowhere so I needed to get some money in my pocket to, to take her out. So I applied for a job riding track work. I'd never done it before, but it wasn't too different to show jumping and eventing, which I was doing. So once I got a bit of money in my pocket, I was more of a show to take her out. And so um, that's how it sort of happened and I happened to meet... Uh, David Ellis at the stables one afternoon and then I took some spellers out on the truck and I was meant to go to university and I just thought oh this would be a great place to work for a year before you know settling into university life so I asked him for a job and he said oh, I haven't got any vacancies but um, I'd taken my CV out so I gave him my CV and that night he, he he read it and he rang me up and offered me a job even though I didn't have one. So, And we've been um, together working together all that time, even when I did a stint with Lindsay Park and, and also Gay Waterhouse and Tommy Smith. It was still through Dave's um, uh, getting me those jobs and I did 
um, six months at each of those, just learning the craft, and then basically come back home and started training uh, when I was uh, probably 25, 26 years old. So I've been doing it for a while. And then, so I was lucky enough to, you know, have the support of Dave and Karen by that time, and we won five premierships at home, but obviously New Zealand, the prize money's not that great. And we looked at a, a another challenge and we wanted extra prize money for our owners, so we ended up choosing Singapore. And at that stage, uh, Singapore was flying. Uh, so we had... The first five years we were there was, you know, racing was still booming, but it just slowly declined and then, of course, COVID hit. And then, of course, Jamie uh, got the call up for Hong Kong, so I felt it was time to come home. But we've still got uh, Tiakao in Singapore and Donna Logan came on board. Um, so uh, it, it works well. It complements the New Zealand stable really well and we've just got to work out when we set up in Australia, which will be in the near future sometime. Uh, and you've obviously had a, a storied career um, to date. Is there a, a certain highlight for you or a certain horse that um, really stands out to you? Um, yeah, well, there's, there's probably a couple of horses. Darcy Brahma was a really good horse and uh, he won the, uh, the Group 1 in Brisbane I think it's renamed now. It was the TJ Smith back then, but um, and then of course Princess Cope was pretty good. Uh, but the one race everyone wants to win in Singapore is the Singapore Gold Cup, and I was lucky enough to win that with a horse called Elite Invincible. So, um, but hopefully, I don't think I've I've probably had our best horse yet. I think that's still in the pipeline. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to. We've had a great bunch of yearlings come through, and I think. From what I've seen, there's still could be our best horses still to come. Awesome. We might have to touch on them in a sec. Uh, we know these days it's very much a, a team operation, but how do you sort of handle the pressure of being uh, the main man in charge of New Zealand's biggest and most successful uh, stable? Well, as I say, I've been doing it from such a young age that you sort of, your whole career you had to deal with pressure at different times and uh, we've got such a fantastic team of staff. Like, there's some really good younger people that are coming through the ranks, and I think a few of them are going to make really good trainers themselves. So, it's not one person. You need a real good team of people, the size of our operation, uh, starting from Dave at the top to Karen, uh, right through to me and Sam, and and the foremans at each barn. So, you know, and and, of course, you need good riders as well. So we've been a bit lucky with Opie over the years, but I suppose he's getting into the twilight of his, of his career, but he's still riding very, very well. But we've got a couple of good younger fellas coming through our system as well. Two horses that uh, I think Australians are quite familiar with and I think really um, helped with Tiako on the map in Australia were Melody Bell and um, a bit of a cult favourite at the Valley, Tiako Shark. Uh, what can you tell us about those two horses and what you think made those two so special? Well, I think Melody Bell, it was just her will to win. She was just a competitor. She was tough, even as a two-year-old, just right through, just a will to win, whereas Tiaka Shark was just a beast of a horse. He was a real giant and just a three-year-old, he showed ability, but he got better at four and then five, and it was just unfortunate. You know, he went blind and... Um, Unfortunately, we he couldn't be saved. So, uh, and it was tragic because I still think he had his best years ahead of him. But unfortunately, that's that's racing at times. And another horse, not quite as tragic, but another horse we did have our eyes on for a potential Cox Plate was Novair. Do you want to just uh, point out what happened to him? Yeah, well, he he ran in the two thousand guineas and he won that, which is a a race in New Zealand that's always hard to win but the format of it's normally really strong. And then he was just getting ready for his his next preparation and he he was injured in track work. Nothing life-threatening, but it was enough to stop and, and then why cut his stud. So he'll get every chance at stud. Uh, you know, he's the son of Zavabil and good-looking horse and, you know, with their broodmare band and, and the farms they've got, 
and their success oh, for the last you know, 20, 30 years has just been incredible and they just seem to keep raising the bar. They just have good horse after good horse year in, year out, come off that farm. So you, you did speak about your career overseas and you obviously started out here and now you're back. What are some things that you've, I guess, noticed the differences since you've been back and also um, the differences in Singapore and New Zealand racing as well? Well, probably one thing I've noticed uh, this time back in uh, to New Zealand training ranks. Uh, back before I left, as I said before, I was training against Dave and Paul O'Sullivan. There was Noel Earls, Colin Jillings, Stephen Trevor McKee, Murray Baker. They've all since retired. So it's sort of a new generation of trainers coming through. Uh, so some of them I didn't really train against last time I was here, but uh, as I say, the real icons and our past champions have all retired so we've got a lot of new younger trainers on the block and still some great older trainers obviously Roger James winning the derby recently uh, but it's the landscape sort of changed a lot so to speak I'm probably one of the older trainers now here um, but Sing Singapore is very different it's just uh, punting orientated it's just all about the punt and uh, that was every race day. There was there was a lot of pressure there, but also exciting as well. They used to have massive crowds, and especially when Joe Marrera was there, he created a lot of a lot of hype about the place. But training in New Zealand, training in Singapore is just like chalk and cheese, completely different. Yeah. And um, just on that international flavour, what sort of is your uh, relationship with Jamie Richards like, and what was? your best advice when he went over to Hong Kong? Yeah, uh, so Jamie uh, was coming through the ranks uh, when I trained for Sir Peter Valor out at uh, Munga Tree. Jamie came out in the school holidays and did a bit of work and obviously he was bright, intelligent young guy, very ambitious and he had a great grounding like he went to Waikato Stud, worked in New Zealand Bloodstock, but just his grounding from his own parents who were great horse people and, you know, the only advice you can have for Asia is just uh, it's a tough environment and you just got to roll with the punches a little bit. And as I say, training in Hong Kong and between New Zealand is very, very different. But Jamie will adapt and, um, you know, I think he'll do very well. The, the first point of call um, for a successful stable comes in the breeding and pre-training industry. Uh, is there something that you look for in particular in the sales? Um, and do here at Tiaka, do you look for the same like family um, pedigrees when you're looking for horses? Yeah, well, I believe the whole racing game myself personally is won and lost at the sale ring gate. Like if, if you buy horses that, you know, are only average horses. They're average horses no matter who trains them. So, you know, that's where we've been spoiled with Dave's great eye for a horse. He's bought a lot of very, very good horses over a long period of time. Oh, obviously, it's a, a team effort too. We have a team of us, Joe Walls, uh, Marcus Corbin, our vets, Ronan Costello, myself, uh, Douglas Black. So, you know, we have several eyes, but at the end of the day, Dave's the one who has to try and put all the owners into it with Karen. So, uh, but that that's where I believe. So we, we just look for athletes. Like you look at some of our great horses over the years, King's Chapel was by King of Kings, a real dud of a stay, and yet he was the best one by him. And um, that's just one example. And we we keep an open mind, as I say, if they're an athlete, doesn't matter what they borrow out of, we'll, we'll normally buy them because at the end of the day, that's what you need to to win races, athletes, yeah. And the tangerine and blue colours of Tiakao becoming really synonymous with uh, with success now. What do those, uh, how do those colours come about and what do they mean to you? Well, obviously, I, you know, I arrived at Tiakao and it was only 500 acres then the stud and I originally helped break in and pre-train the horses out there. So it's grown to 4,000 acres now. So it's a big, big operation, but I've also been a part of the growth of it all and it's been exciting to see 
the colours back then, they they obviously didn't have huge amount of horses. I think Dave started the stable off with maybe 30 horses and, you know, we've grown to normally around 100 and work now. So, uh, but obviously if you have more more numbers as well, you're going to have a lot more success. Just the way the game has gone these days. Um, but, yeah, it would be nice to win one of the majors in Australia, uh, that's for sure. So, um, obviously... Cox Plate would be nice anyway. <laughs> What's well, a nice segue into the, the next question. So speaking of the majors, our major race, the uh, Ladbrokes Cox Plate, when you kind of first yeah think of that race, what is the, the first thoughts that come to your mind? Well, pro- probably the first thoughts, uh, Bone Crusher, Waverly Star, just that iconic race. Uh, you, you still sort of watch it whenever you see it, maybe once a year when they have replays in the... Uh, the hair on your arms still sort of stand up like it's such a great race and uh, obviously Winks took it to another level and um, I think Ocean Park might have been the last New Zealand horse to win it so hopefully we're due to win it again. <laughs> and just some of your other favourite memories, have you been able to come over and watch many Cox plates? What are, what are some of your other favourites? Yeah, well, we were l- lucky enough to have a couple of runners. King's Chapel ran in it and uh, Princess Cope ran it, but, but we didn't have much luck in those races. And uh, But the atmosphere on the day is just electric, isn't it, because you're so close to the racetrack. Uh, I haven't been back to Mooney Valley since they've changed it a little bit, but I'll be looking forward to certainly getting back there in years to come. So the Cox Plate for us and I think for, for many people in Australia is it's the best race. Um, what do you think a horse needs to win um, our great race? Well, obviously it needs a big engine for a start. Like You don't really see a bad horse win a Cox Plate, that's for sure. So you can have some years that are a bit weaker than others, but as a rule... Uh, takes an extremely good horse and probably a horse that with a high cruising speed from probably the 1,000 if not the 1,200 that can sustain that speed. So it's a very special horse that that wins that race. And, and of course the internationals are targeting it a bit more now so it's become a little bit harder as well. Uh, but it, it's just one of the top four, isn't it? There's the Cox Plate, Melbourne Cup, Caulfield Cup and obviously the Golden Slipper. But... Um, they don't call it the weight for age championship for nothing, that's for sure. Yeah, And a, and a good judge tells us that uh, Imperatriz could be a good chance to come over. Um, do you think she could be a horse that'll stretch out to 2,000 metres and potentially target a Cox Plate, or what other horses in your stable might you uh, nominate? It might be just a year too soon for Imperatriz. We'd just see how she goes through the early part of the spring, but I wouldn't say she couldn't get 2,000 later on but maybe this time round could be just a year too soon for her but um, obviously the next month six weeks tells us a lot about we start to trial them shortly and then you just see how they come up like sometimes three-year-old form goes into their four-year-old year sometimes it doesn't quite stack up uh, because they've been racing against their own age but it'll she'll certainly be an interesting runner that's for sure and we're here to celebrate the centenary of the WS Cox Plate. Um, what would it mean if you were able to come over, you know, come over to Australia this year and win that centenary Cox Plate? Oh well, obviously, you know, it's such an iconic race that it'd be a thrill of a lifetime, wouldn't it? Um, so you never know. As I say, uh, I think there's no early nominations now, so that probably helps as well. So. If your horse was certainly flying at the time and without those real early nominations, closer to the time, you might have a throw at the stumps. Who knows? Awesome. Well, thank you, Mark. That's all we've. Uh, that's all our questions. Thanks for having us at the stable this morning. Good luck this spring, and hopefully we see you there on Cox Plate Day. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks Mark.